When you've got a beam or a ruler or something supported at one point, it's pretty obvious that the question is about moments, and it's obvious where the pivot is. But when you get questions where something is supported at two points or supported at both ends, it's not quite as obvious, and you might not at first even spot that it's a moments question. So question one talks about a uniform metre rule of weight 1.2 newtons. So it says it's uniform, it says it's 1.2 newtons, so of course the weight will act in the middle. And it says it rests horizontally on two knife edges. When it says knife edge, it just means two points that it's supported on. One's at the 100mm mark, and the other's at the 800mm mark. Now if I draw them on one at a time, If I draw that as a knife edge that it's balanced on, then you can see how, if there were no other forces, this thing would pivot about that point, and the weight would cause it to turn clockwise. If you want to stop it turning clockwise, you've got to provide either a downward force on this side, or do just the same job by providing an upward force on this side, so that it's balanced, it stays in equilibrium it doesn't turn about that pivot. Now one good way of providing an upward force on something is just to bung something underneath it. And that's what happens in this question. It's supported at the 800mm mark. Now if the support might be an object, in this case it's something that calls it a knife edge, but all it's doing is providing a force. So this other support is providing the force that prevents it from turning clockwise. So it's still a moments question, it's still got a pivot there it could turn, turn about. It doesn't turn because it's been held up here by a force, and the force just happens to be provided by another support. Or we could of course have drawn them the other way around, we could have drawn this one first, and we could have said that the weight of the ruler is trying to make this thing turn anticlockwise, but it doesn't turn anticlockwise because there's a force stopping it, and the, the force that stops it turning anticlockwise about this pivot is the force that's provided, the upward support provided here. Right, so it is still a moments question, it is still about things having a tendency to turn either clockwise or anticlockwise, but if the thing's in equilibrium, the moments balance, it doesn't turn. And since it doesn't turn about either pivot, it doesn't matter which pivot you use when you're trying to work out the moment. So the question asks us to find, it's, well, first of all it asks us to sketch the arrangement, so we've got the arrangement there, I've drawn those two supports as little arrows, but we know that what those little arrows are doing, those knife edges, they're providing forces upwards. So it makes sense to draw it as a force. So we've got 1.2 newtons acting down, and we've got two forces acting upwards. I could call the forces F1 and F2 if I wanted. Now, because I'm going to be taking moments, and I'm going to be using the places where these knife edges are to take moments about, it's a lot easier if I give those places names. So I can call that place there A, and that place there B. It makes it just easier to refer to. And if I'm calling that place A, actually, a more logical name for the force, instead of calling it F1, I could call it FA. And if I'm calling that place B, it would probably be a more logical name, instead of calling it F2, call it FB. So, if I want to find either of these forces, I've got to take moments. And we said you can take moments about a, or you can take moments about B, you can actually take moments about anywhere you like. You could take moments about the middle if you wanted. You could take moments about that edge, because the thing's in equilibrium. It isn't turning. So of all the places it possibly could turn about, it isn't doing it. It's balancing. So take moments where you like. We know it's in equilibrium, so we know that the principle of moments applies. So we know the total clockwise moment equals the total anticlockwise moment. And we're doing this in an exam, so we go to the trouble of writing it, because you never know. You might get a mark just for knowing that if everything else goes wrong. So, if I want to find one of these forces, I've got to decide where to take moments about. If I choose to take moments about the middle, then I get an equation that's got FA in it and it's got FB in it. But I can't find either of them, because it just connects the two together. If I choose to take moments about A, then the good thing about taking moments about A is that this force, FA, passes through the pivot, so it doesn't have a moment. So if I take moments about A, and I say total clockwise moment, or which force provides a clockwise moment about A, it's going to be this one. This force times the distance, 
you need to work out the distance, it's not difficult. This force times that distance is the clockwise moment. What's providing the anti-clockwise moment? Well, the weight would cause the, the ruler to tend to turn clockwise. Why can't it turn clockwise? It can't turn clockwise because B is holding it up. So the force at B is providing an anti-clockwise moment. We find the moment by taking that force FB and multiplying it by that distance. So if we write that equation, put the values in, we're then able to find FB. When we've done that, we need to find FA. And there's two ways of doing it. One way is to start all over again and say, right, well, I want to find FA. Let's imagine that if FA wasn't there, it would pivot about B. So FA is the force that's stopping it from turning anticlockwise, pivoting about B. So I could take my moments about B, and this time the clockwise moment is FA times that distance. And that balances the anticlockwise moment, which is the 1.2 newtons, times that distance. Again, you get an equation, you better find FA. Well, there is actually a quicker way. Once you've found one of the upward forces, we can sort of say, well, the whole thing is in equilibrium. So the total upward force must equal the total downward force. So if we know the total downward force, and we know one of the upward forces, that gives us a quicker way of finding the other upward force. Question 2 uses exactly the same ideas. It's not a ruler, it's a big heavy beam, it's not supported on knife edges, it's supported on walls. But apart from that, and apart from the numbers being different, the situation is exactly the same. If this wall wasn't here, the beam would drop down at the left hand side. In other words, it would pivot about this point here. But the wall is there, the wall's holding it up. How do you hold something up? You hold something up by providing a force. So there's going to be an upward force there, provided by the wall. And similarly, there's an upward force here provided by the by this wall. Because if this wall wasn't here, the beam would pivot about the left hand side and drop down. But it doesn't drop down because this wall's holding it up, so this wall's putting an upward force. Once you've got that, it's a case of taking moments, just like before. So you can choose to take moments about here, or you can choose to take moments about here. Doesn't matter which one you do. If you take moments about here, that lets you find the force that acts here. Or if you choose to take moments about here, that lets you take that lets you find the force that acts upwards there. There's a little sort of sting in the tail for this one though. Part A, you've calculated the support force of each wall on the beam. So each wall is providing an upward force on the beam, stopping the beam from falling down. Part B, how do you find the force of the beam on each wall? At first glance you might think that's a completely new question that you've got to start working out. But actually, if you know the force that the wall puts on the beam at this point, it's very straightforward to remember a quick and easy rule that lets you straight away find the force that the beam must put on the wall. 